stripping of the upper pane. For an instant, he hung suspended between balance and falling. His fingertips pressed onto the quarter-inch wood strips. Then with utmost delicacy, with a focused concentration of all his senses, he increased even further the strain on his fingertips hooked to these slim edgings of wood. Elbows slowly bending, he began to draw the full weight of his upper body forward. Knowing that the instant his fingers slipped off these quarter-inch strips, he'd plunge backward and be falling. Elbows imperceptibly bending, body shaking with the strain, the sweat starting from his forehead in great sudden drops, he pulled, his entire being and thought concentrated in his fingertips. Then, suddenly, the strain slackened and ended, his chest touching the windowsill, and he was kneeling on the ledge, his forehead pressed to the glass of the closed window. Dropping his palms to the sill, he stared into his living room, at the red-brown Davenport across the room, at a magazine he had left there, at the pictures on the walls, and the gray rug, the entrance to the hallway. Everything looks different, his right? Papers, typewriter, and desk, not two feet from his nose. A movement from his desk caught his eye, and he saw that it was a thin curl of blue smoke. His cigarette, the ash long, was still burning in the ashtray where he'd left it. This was past all belief, only a few minutes before. Right, because the, the genius of the story is that you forget he's only been out on this ledge for just a few minutes. Students have often said, it seems like an eternity once I kind of get sucked into this story and I realize you're out on that ledge. He makes it back to the window, and then he gets ready to fall, and the window closes, and now here he is holding on to the window, and he looks in at where he was just a few minutes ago. Let's put it in our notes at level 2A, already a major message here. Our view of the world, our perspective, can radically change moment to moment. Let's jump to 3A really quickly. When you're a senior, you're going to study Swift's Gulliver's Travels, a text that maybe you've heard about where Gulliver takes these journeys, and in one part of the journey, he ends up being this huge giant, and he gets tied down by the Lilliputians, and they tie his hair down to the ground. You've maybe seen pictures of this, or you remember this story. In the next experience, he's the little, little tiny man in a, in a, in a country where everybody's huge. That is to say, Swift's making the same point Phineas. Everything is about perspective. The way we see the world radically alters. When you're inside of your apartment, you don't think about the fact that right on the other side of the wall is nothing but space. Here we go. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen next. Again, the power of a story when you know you got a few pages left of the story. What's going to happen next? There he is, out on a ledge, 11 stories up off the floor. His head moved, and in faint reflection from the glass before him, he saw the yellow paper clenched in his front teeth. Lifting a hand from the sill, he took it from his mouth. The moistened corner parted from the paper, and he spat it out. Top of 129. For a moment, in the light from the living room, he stared wonderingly at the yellow sheet in his hand, and then crushed it into the side pocket of his jacket. That is to say, the title of the story. He couldn't open the window. It had been pulled not completely closed, but its lower edge was below the level of the outside sill. There was no room to get his fingers underneath it. Between the upper sash and the lower was a gap not wide enough, reaching up he tried, to get his fingers into. He couldn't push it open. The upper window panel, he knew from long experience, was impossible to move, frozen tight with dried paint. Very carefully observing his balance, the fingertips of his left hand again hooked to the narrow stripping of the window casing, he drew back his right hand, palm facing the glass, and then struck the glass with the heel of his hand. 
His arm rebounded from the pain, his body tottering, and he knew he didn't dare strike a harder blow. But in the security and relief of his new position, he simply smiled. With only a sheet of glass between him and the room just before him, it was not possible that there wasn't a way past it. Eyes narrowing, he thought for a few moments about what to do. Then his eyes widened, for nothing occurred to him. But still, he felt calm. The trembling, he realized, had stopped. At the back of his mind, there still lay the thought that once he was again in his home, he could give release to his feelings. He actually would lie on the floor, rolling, clutching tufts of the rug in his hands. He would literally run across the room, free to move as he liked, jumping on the floor, testing and reveling in its absolute security, letting the relief flood through him, draining the fear from his mind and body. His yearning for this was astonishingly intense. And somehow he understood that he had better keep this feeling at bay. In other words, you never really know what you have. You really, really never know what you love. You never really know what's important in your life until you're standing on the outside of a ledge looking in at it and you go, whoa, it's the simplest things in my life that I would give anything for right now. By the way, notice on page 129, literature in context with your science connection, physics. Tom is on the ledge. I'm just reading with you on 129. Tom is on the ledge with only a pane of glass between him and safety, yet he's reluctant to hit the window to break the glass with good reason. Tom understands Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. For example, the action of throwing a ball against the wall is the opposite reaction of the ball bouncing away from the wall. And the question here is, what opposite reaction does Tom fear will result if he breaks the, if he hits the glass hard, but it doesn't break. In other words, he could try to knee really hard, but the moment he knees, if he doesn't break that glass, what's going to happen in terms of physics? He's going to be repelled back off that ledge, right? So here he is, looking in at where he once was, and he's out on this ledge, and it's nighttime, and the wind is, of course, the cold is going to start to play a role. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen. By the way, notice we keep having interesting comments about pockets. I wonder what this title of this story is all about. He took a half dollar from his pocket and struck it against the pane, but without any hope that the glass would break and with very little disappointment when it did not. After a few moments of thought, he drew his leg up onto the ledge and picked loose the knot of his shoelace. He slipped off the shoe, and holding it across the instep, drew back his arm as far as he dared, and struck the leather heel against the glass. Pretty smart, right? The pain rattled, but he knew he'd been a long way from breaking it. His foot was cold, and he slipped the shoe back on. He shouted again experimentally, and then once more, but there was no answer. 130, top of 130. The realization suddenly struck him that he might have to wait here till Claire came home. Right? And for a moment, the thought was funny. He could see Claire opening the front door, withdrawing her key from the lock, closing the door behind her, and then glancing up to see him crouched on the other side of the window. He could see her rush across the room, face astounded and frightened and hear himself shouting instructions. Never mind how I got here, just open the wind. She couldn't open it, he remembered. She'd never been able to. She'd always had to call him. She'd have to get the building superintendent or a neighbor. And he pictured himself smiling and answering their questions as he climbed in. I just wanted to get a breath of fresh air, so... He couldn't possibly wait here till Claire came home. It was the second feature she'd wanted to see, and she'd left in time to see the first. She'd be another three hours or... Right. He glanced at his watch. How much time can Claire you last? had been gone eight minutes. Eight minutes, an eternity. It wasn't possible. 
but only eight minutes ago he had kissed his wife goodbye. She wasn't even at the theater yet. Right? It would be four hours before she could possibly be home. And he tried to picture himself kneeling out here, fingertips hooked to these narrow strippings, while first one movie, preceded by a slow listing of credits, began, developed, reached its climax, and then finally ended. There'd be a newsreel next, maybe, and then an animated cartoon, and then interminable scenes from coming pictures. Interminable, endless. And then, once more, the beginning of a full-length picture. While all the time he hung out here in the night. Hung out, right? He might possibly get to his feet, but he was afraid to try. Already his legs were cramped, his thigh muscles tired, his knees hurt, his feet felt numb, and his hands were stiff. He couldn't possibly stay out here for four hours or anywhere near it. Long before that, his legs and arms would give out. He would be forced to try changing his position often, stiffly, clumsily, his coordination and strength gone, and he would fall. Quite realistically, he knew that he would fall. No one could stay out here on this ledge for four hours. A dozen windows in the apartment building across the street were lighted. Looking over his shoulder, he could see the top of a man's head behind the newspaper he was reading. In another window, he saw the blue-gray flicker of a television screen. No more than 20-odd yards from his back were scores of people, and if just one of them would walk idly to his window and glance out, for some moments he stared over his shoulder at the lighted rectangles, waiting. But no one appeared. Top of 131. The man reading his paper turned a page and then continued his reading. A figure passed another of the windows and was immediately gone. In the inside... Let's, pa let's pa uh, pause for a moment, write this one down. Notice the symbolism of a man out on a ledge, all alone in the city, looking over his shoulder and seeing all kinds of people in the other buildings in the rooms. They're kind of doing their own thing. Jot down in your notes, what's symbolic about what maybe Finney is suggesting about the solitary nature of people who live in the city? The ways in which... They see people, but they don't see people. They live so alone. Here he is, all alone, up on the top of this building's ledge, all by himself, alone, isolated. And then again, the mention of the word pocket. Did you see it? Let's go back to it. The pocket of his jacket. He found a little sheaf of papers, and he pulled one out and looked at it in the light from the living room. It was an old letter. An advertisement of some sort. His name and address in purple ink were on a label pasted to the envelope. Gripping one end of the envelope in his teeth, he twisted it into a tight curl. From his shirt pocket, he brought out a book of matches. He didn't dare let go the casing with both hands, but with the twist of paper in his teeth, he opened the matchbook with his free hand then he bent one of the matches in two without tearing it from the folder, its red-tipped end now touching the striking surface. With his thumb, he rubbed the red tip across the striking area. He did it again, then again, and still again, pressing harder each time, and the match suddenly flared, burning his thumb. But he kept it alight cupping the matchbook in his hand and shielding it with his body. He held the flame to the paper in his mouth till it caught. Then he snuffed out the match flame with his thumb and forefinger, careless of the burn, and replaced the book in his pocket. Taking the paper twist in his hand, he held it flame down, watching the flame crawl up the paper till it flared bright. Then he held it behind him over the street, moving it from side to side, 
watching it over his shoulder, the flame flickering and guttering in the wind. There were three letters in his pocket, and he lighted each of them, holding each till the flame touched his hand and then dropping it to the street below. At one point, watching over his shoulder while the last of the letters burned, he saw the man across the street put down his paper and stand, even seeming to Tom to glance toward his window. But when he moved, it was only to walk across the room and disappear from sight. There were a dozen coins in Tom Beneke's pocket, and he dropped them three or four at a time. But if they struck anyone, or if anyone noticed their falling, no one connected them with their source, and no one glanced upward. Right, nobody looks up in the city. His arms had begun to tremble from the steady strain of clinging to this narrow perch, and he did not know what to do now, and was terribly frightened. Clinging to the window stripping with one hand, he again searched his pockets. But now, one thirty-two. He left his wallet on his dresser when he changed clothes. There was nothing left but the yellow sheet. It occurred to him irrelevantly that his death on the sidewalk below would be an eternal mystery. Right here we go. The, the title window closed. Why? How? And from where could he have fallen? No one would be able to identify his body for a time either. The thought was somehow unbearable and increased his fear. All they'd find in his pockets would be the yellow sheet. Right, the irony. Contents of the dead man's pockets, he thought. One sheet of paper bearing penciled notations incomprehensible. He understood fully that he might actually be going to die. His arms, maintaining his balance on the ledge, were trembling steadily now. And it occurred to him then with all the force of a revelation that if he fell, all he was ever going to have out of life, he would then abruptly have had. Nothing then could ever be changed. And nothing more, no least experience or pleasure could ever be added to his life. He wished then that he had not allowed his wife to go off by herself tonight and on similar nights. He thought of all the evenings he had spent away from her, working, and he regretted them. He thought wonderingly of his fierce ambition and of the direction his life had taken. He thought of the hours he'd spent by himself, filling the yellow sheet that had brought him out here contents of the dead man's pockets, he thought with sudden fierce anger, a wasted life. Now, we, we're familiar with this idea, aren't we? Let's jump to 3A really quickly. We're familiar with this idea because we know Dickens' classic Christmas carol, the Scrooge story, remember it? So you've got that story about Scrooge the billionaire who is visited by the ghost of Christmas past. He doesn't like it, seeing his past. The ghost of Christmas present makes him a little more mad. It's that third ghost who shows up, remember, and just points at a tombstone, won't say anything. And it's at that moment that Scrooge realizes he's looking at his own tombstone that he knows it. Oh, no way. We have often said it this way. It's at that moment that every human being speaks the same words. The words are, oh my God. The only question is the inflection of the voice. Yes? In other words, oh my God, what have I done with my life? Oh no, no, no. And now all of a sudden, note the irony of this. Standing on a ledge, 11 stories off the floor, he realizes when I fall... The only thing they're going to find in my pockets is this yellow sheet of paper that led me to come out here, which had everything to do, are you reading it again? The fierce ambition of the direction his life had taken. He's so ambitious. He wants to make it to the top. Note the irony again of the symbolism. He wants to make it so badly to the top. He wants to be known. He wants to be remembered. And now he's going to fall. And the only thing anybody's ever going to know about him is from his pockets is this yellow sheet of paper. And then the final line again, a wasted life. We're reminded of that final line of Leonardo da Vinci who said right before he died, I've wasted my days. This man, Tom, realizes at the final moment of his life, 
It's all been kind of a waste. By the way, did you notice what he's thinking about? Interestingly, Scrooge does the same thing. At this moment, Tom's thinking about his girl who he let go to the movie alone. He could have gone with her, but he didn't. And all the other times he let her go alone, but he did, you know, and he let her go and he could have gone with her and he didn't. In other words, at the pivotal moment, here's a two-way observation. At the pivotal moment of our life, at, the, at our death's moment, we're either going to be prepared for that moment and accept that moment because we lived a good life. And that is to say, we spent the appropriate amount of time, energy with the people we love. Well, we're going to regret that. Notice here, a wasted life. All right, let's see how this thing ends now. We're coming to the end of the story. What is it that some students have said, man, this is a fascinating story about a philosophy of life. What really matters to you if this was the last day you lived on this planet? What would you regret? What would you be pleased about? Let's take a look at how Tom ends it all. He was simply not going to cling here till he slipped and fell. He told himself that now. There was one last thing he could try. He had been aware of it for some moments, refusing to think about it. But now he faced it. Kneeling here on the ledge, the fingertips of one hand pressed to the narrow strip of wood. He could, he knew, draw his other hand back a yard, perhaps, fist clenched tight, doing it very slowly, till he sensed the outer limit of balance. Then, as hard as he was able from the distance, he could drive his fist forward against the glass. Right? Punch the window. If it broke, his fist smashing through, he was safe. He might cut himself badly and probably would, but with his arm inside the room, he would be secure. But if the glass did not break, the rebound...